It's a pleasure to be joined by Helen Clark, three-time Prime Minister of New Zealand, the ex-administrator of the United Nations Development Program, and someone who has had a career in diplomacy for over 37 years. He was India's last ambassador and permanent representative at the United Nations. And uh, one is joining us from Delhi, the other from Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, you are in two towers, so as to speak, both of you in virtual towers, but I do believe a little birdie told me that you were neighbors as well in a certain Trump tower earlier. I think so. Yes. <laughs> in New yes. York. That's true. <laughs> well, it's great to have you. Ms. Clark, if I can just start uh, with the developments that happened on the 8th of May in the United Nations Security Council, the france Tunisia joint uh, resolution that uh, wasn't even voted on because of uh, the big power dynamics, big power politics there, something that you've been very vocal against in terms of global leadership and how the United Nations Security Council has not been able to step up to where it should be in this uh, pandemic. I think it's very disappointing. And by the way, last Friday was also a very important anniversary in global health because it was the day that marked the 40th anniversary of the eradication of smallpox. Now, at the height of the Cold War, countries, regardless of ideological position or geopolitics, came together and said, we are going to work collaboratively to eradicate smallpox, and it happened. Here we are in one of the worst crises of probably the, you know, the last 120 years, and our Security Council has not been able to step up to the task. Some of us have been urging that it should pass a resolution similar to that which was passed for Ebola to declare uh, this uh, terrible COVID-19 a threat to global peace and security. It hasn't done that. Eventually, France and Tunisia, as you said, uh, got a resolution up and it sought uh, primarily uh, to express support for the Secretary General's very important call uh, for a global ceasefire so that everybody, every warring party anywhere, could focus full attention on fighting the pandemic. And the resolution failed. It failed, uh, presumably, we're told, because the United States didn't like the reference to support for relevant um, health uh, specialised agencies of the United Nations. Now, this just isn't good enough. When we're faced with an existential health crisis, like a pandemic, uh, surely we can put geopolitics aside and work on it as our forebears did uh, 40 and more years ago. Ambassador Mukherjee, the breakdown in leadership of the United Nations Security Council, as, as Ms. Clark is putting it in terms, in times of this pandemic, do you see COVID actually possibly being a catalyst to uh, getting that global leadership moving at the United Nations Security Council in particular in terms of reform that has been hanging fire for decades now? Yes, I think that uh, the time is come. COVID-19 could be the catalyst which we have been waiting for. Uh, 15 years ago at the 2005 World uh, Summit at New York, Global leaders had unanimously mandated a reform of the Security Council. We did make progress uh, up to 2015, the year in which we adopted, as uh, uh, Ms. Clark knows, as UNDP administrator, the most ambitious agenda for humanity, which was Agenda 2030 on sustainable development. There is a clear link in uh, that agenda, between that agenda and uh, the maintenance of peace and security. It's written into the preamble of that agenda. So I think that today for big powers to try and uh, distract people and, and carry on playing with their geopolitical uh, games uh, in the Security Council is uh, not going to be accepted uh, much longer by the international community. And reform of the Security Council, therefore, is an uh, issue whose time has come. Ms. Clark, do you see that really realistically happening? I mean, we're talking about UN reform. We've seen how the veto has been used so many times. Uh, in the United Nations Security Council. Do you see it realistically actually happening, the pressure from the international community because of uh, COVID? I think there has to be 
a very, very wide coalition built among the member states now uh, for reform of the Security Council because we're all watching what's happening and saying, where are they? If in 2014 they could act on an epidemic, why can't they act on this one, which is so much more threatening to so many more people around the world? And a, a pandemic which has had the effect of becoming a global economic and social crisis as, as well. And that always hurts most of the, the world's poor, uh, the poor countries and the world's poorest countries uh, the most. So there needs to be, I think, really a, a, an uprising by the member states to say, we expect better. Uh, and, you know, I, I, it, it pains me to say it, but, but there is a member state that is just making this incredibly difficult. But, you know, when, unfortunately, this is happening in the run-up to the presidential election campaign in the United States, we're all looking at the polling, which is showing uh, now not good levels of approval for the way the administration has handled uh, the pandemic. And I think uh, there's been a decision that the only card to play is to beat up on the country where the virus uh, first emerged and beat up on the World Health Organization, which has been doing its best uh, to try and address the problem. Now, this is just hopeless uh, and really is letting many countries down at a time when we need global solidarity and support. So if this is not a catalyst for reform, what, what is? It, what will be? Uh, Ambassador Mukherjee, now an uprising in the, the United Nations among the other international community. Uh, is that again, what, just take us through how that can be done in uh, the General Assembly. And like uh, Ms. Clark is pointing out here, is it now that the common person probably understands or sees how the United Nations Security Council or the UN has been virtually mute because of geopolitics? And since it affects the common man, that pressure could be added uh, to make changes? Yes, I think uh, uh, if we just take a step back, I did mention uh, the agreement among all countries in 2005 to reform the Security Council. And uh, the progress that we made uh, was incremental, but it was steady. It moved uh, with countries like New Zealand, Australia, India, United Kingdom, France. We all put our heads together and we moved to propose uh, the reform of the Security Council in the five clearly uh, designated agreed areas, which includes the question of the veto. But now uh, what has happened is in the last four years, that process has been stymied by uh, one permanent member, but that permanent member has not been stopped by the other four. And I think the time has come now for us to go back to the discussions in 2009 in the General Assembly, when the issue of convening a general conference of the United Nations to review the UN Charter and to make the UN fit for purpose was last discussed. And in that discussion in 2009, it was said that we expect the ongoing negotiations on Security Council reform to lead into such a general conference. Now, if the reform is not taking place, I think we'll have to move towards convening a general conference. Can that general conference actually take place? Because then there are clear rules there in terms of numbers, two thirds, 11 of uh, the um, 15 Security Council members and no veto allowed Ms. Clark. Well, I mean, I absolutely agree with Ambassador Mukherjee that uh, we need something to, to be a circuit breaker. And uh, if the negotiations have gone nowhere, perhaps the pressure now to push for uh, that general conference to relook at the Charter. This is also the 75th anniversary year of the United Nations. And before the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of planning going on as to how this uh, might be marked. What more fitting way to mark it than at the point of 75 years to say, this isn't working very well. And let us use this anniversary as an opening uh, to look at how we make it fit for purpose for the next 25 years uh, through to the centennial of the UN. Mr. Lask, but you still need somebody to lead the way, even if that's going to happen. We've seen 
on a regional level, say Prime Minister Modi with SARC countries, South Asia, G20 as well. But you still need that leadership uh, to move things forward since they haven't done so for so many years. And and I think it, it needs a broad coalition of, of, of countries. Mm. I remember back in the 1980s when New Zealand was pursuing its, its nuclear-free policy and uh, it joined up with a a group of six nations. It was called the Six Nation Peace Initiative. And it was a wonderfully broad group. There was New Zealand, uh, there was Mexico, there was Greece, <laughs> there was Egypt, uh, and and you know, and a couple of others. You need a group that's drawn from across regions, mm. north, south, uh, to say, you know, we're going to work to take this head. I think it's got to be seen to have that broad support. I'd be very surprised if you couldn't assemble such a coalition of, of lead nations who could then take many more with them. Ambassador Mukherjee, 75th anniversary of the United Nations. I do know that uh, you're doing a lot of work on that. We're expecting a book, I think, later this year. Mm -hmm. And you might have to devise a lot if what both of you are saying actually happens. Uh, just put into context India's role here, we should be elected unopposed to the Security Council, of course, uh, non-veto and non-permanent. How should we be looking forward to galvanize what Ms. Clark is saying, a multitude of countries? Well, I think that uh, in uh, the campaign for this uh, non-permanent seat that has been going on for the last couple of years, uh, India has been positioning herself as a uh, a country which will try and focus the United Nations Security Council on the uh, the ground level issues, if I may call it that. And uh, for a country like India, ground level issues are really related to development and sustainable development. Uh, and for that, the Security Council has to provide the supportive framework of peace and security. So uh, this is uh, the, the broad approach that India would take. But as you said, India would assume the uh, chair of the uh, group of 20 in 2022, which is the second year of our two-year term in the Security Council. And uh, I would uh, expect that India would take an initiative to convene a meeting of the Security Council to focus on uh, these ground-level uh, issues. Because uh, without focusing on the importance of issues like employment, like migration, like uh, food security, and so on, uh, health security, uh, they, they're, they're, so, they're very clearly uh, now laid down in front of us in the uh, 17 development, uh, uh, sustainable development goals. So we need to, uh, to, to integrate that reality in which all the citizens of the world live with the work that the Charter of the United Nations mandated the Security Council to do, which was to maintain international peace and security. Now, there's a complete mismatch today between the work being done in that Security Council and the work being done on the ground. When you're talking about uh, health policy, if I can just look forward, Ms. Clark, uh, to next week, now May 18th, 19th, when the World Health Organization's World Health Assembly meets, and there's already a lot of debate uh, on that. Where do you, do you see that body also? You've seen what's happened with the UN Security Council and the WHO also falling prey to politics. Oh, yes. I understand that uh, there has been some kind of resolution on the table for negotiation, and uh, it's proving to be e extremely difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the US, of course, is, is, is looking at defunding the WHO, but, but that won't be stopping it, uh, putting its oar in on the negotiation of the resolution. And then if it's going to try and politicize the resolution, I, I can give you a long list of other countries who will also be looking to have some political uh, content in, in, in the resolution. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be a terribly happy meeting at the, the World Health Assembly. It, it won't be a meeting uh, of minds, uh, not just for the you know, particular reasons we're discussing here, but uh, frankly, the, you know, there's a number of countries who haven't followed World Health Organization advice uh, around the pandemic, and uh, so and if things haven't gone well for them, as for example, they haven't gone well in the US, they'll be looking for someone to blame. And there's the poor WHO, which is in the firing line, somehow somehow to blame. 
uh, which, which I think is unfair. So I don't predict a happy meeting. Fortunately, it won't be an in-person meeting because of the pandemic. It'll be a virtual meeting and not terribly long, so the agony won't be protracted. But uh, really, the WHO needs to be supported to, to do its job. You know, it, it is an important. It doesn't get everything right. You know, not, don't let perfection be, be the enemy of the good. We need these institutions and we need to support them. Ambassador Mukherjee, now again, like in the United Nations Security Council, India will be assuming a leadership role in uh, the World Health uh, Assembly and the WHO as well. Uh, where do you see that going? We've, we've heard both the Prime Minister, we've heard uh, even the Foreign Secretary talking about the larger issues of uh, public health, of uh, global institutions. Where do you see that panning out, Ambassador Mukherjee? Well, I think uh, we've had a good and long association with the World Health Organization, which has done extremely good work in India. I mean, some of the things that uh, that Prime Minister Clark mentioned, like smallpox or polio, I mean, these things have happened on the ground in India because mm -hmm. of the World Health Organization. And therefore, for India, it makes no sense to trash the World Health Organization or to reduce its, uh, its acceptance and its integrity. And I think that we need to take a, a hard look at how the World Health Organization can be uh, enabled to uh, implement the reforms that it proposed in 2016 when the Director General of the World Health Organization came to the UN General Assembly and spoke about the Ebola uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had said, Dr. Margaret Chen at that time had said, that this requires political commitment from the WHO member states, a structural change within the organization, an evolution of an internal culture, and strengthening of relationships with external actors. And I think India's experience shows that this is the way forward. In uh, 20 years ago, you may remember, uh, the world was confronting the HIV AIDS uh, crisis. And at that time, the United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council got together and supported an organization called UN AIDS. And UN AIDS brought in all of UN approach. All the UN uh, entities and, and players were brought in, and we succeeded in uh, not eradicating HIV AIDS, but in mitigating it to an extent that today most countries are able to cope with this problem. And I think the same lesson has to be uh, learned uh, with regard to COVID-19 and uh, the uh, forthcoming meeting of the World Health As Assembly. And I think that uh, in this, there is a lot of expectation that uh, a leadership role, for example, India becoming an elected member of the executive board now of the World Health Organization and chairing it for one year may give a leadership role. But I think that when you step back, you realize that uh, the leadership role can only come through a team effort. It cannot be done unilaterally. And I think that there are 34 elected members in the board and these 34 countries and specialists have to work together as a team. And I think that is where the challenge will lie. Working together as a team, Helen Clark, one of the issues that is being brought up is the inclusion or the readmission of Taiwan, Chinese Taipei into the World Health Assembly. Uh, New Zealand has taken a position on that, at least your foreign minister has. Uh, where does that, does that put another spoke in the spanner, so as to speak? Well, there is no way and the line no way that Taiwan can be a member of the World Health Assembly. Uh, at my last check, only about 15 quite small states uh, recognised Taiwan as the Republic of China. And diplomatic relations for all the other member states of the UN with the People's Republic of China are predicated on accepting a one China policy. So you can't have two Chinas sitting at the World Health Assembly. Uh, however, uh, what happened in 2009 at the height of the swine flu uh, uh, pandemic uh, was that Director General of WHO, Margaret Chan, did invite, uh, quote, Chinese Taipei uh, to take a seat at the table because it's in the interest of global public health, obviously, that uh, uh, everyone can uh, be part of a, a debate in such circumstances. And you want my personal opinion? I think that this would be a time to issue such an invitation without in any way challenging uh, the One China uh, policy, because I think a pandemic uh, needs to bring about a solidarity around the technical issue of fighting a pandemic that's separated out from uh, from geopolitics. 
But uh, unfortunately, this will become a highly politicized uh, issue uh, as well. Uh, in a way, it, it, it might have been uh, a very smart move for China itself to indicate to the Director General of WHO that in the circumstances and knowing the importance of uh, stopping uh, transmission, uh, that Chinese Taipei might have a seat at the table. I also uh, note on this that for the nine years I was New Zealand Prime Minister, I used to go every year to the APEC Leaders Summit. Yes. Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And every Chinese year, Taipei is a member because it's an economic table. It is correct. Chinese Taipei sits at the table alongside, you know, the same room as the President of the People's Republic of China. So, it, in a sense, w where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I think it's unfortunate this is seen as, a, as an American move that China would automatically react to. I think we need to look at the special circumstances of the pandemic and of global health and, and act accordingly. Ambassador Mukherjee, as Helen Clark is pointing out there, there has been a precedence and it has been the People's Republic of China, China itself. Uh, Margaret Chen, who was the WHO head, who invited uh, Chinese Taipei there to be an observer. How do you see that moving forward or is it again going to be just caught up in this US versus uh, China blame game? Well, I think I'd like to make two points there. I agree uh, with what Prime Minister Clark has said about uh, having the, uh, the two uh, having Chinese Taipei and the Re People's Republic of China together uh, in the w uh, World Health uh, Assembly. I have worked in the World Trade Organization and there too, uh, these two are in the same room. So there is uh, obviously enough precedent uh, for this to happen, provided there is a political will to make it happen. But I think that uh, uh, the bigger picture needs to be also kept in mind. And uh, there it is the contribution of each member uh, of the World Health Assembly and the World Health Organization towards the objective of getting a solution to this pandemic. Uh, for example, people are talking of a vaccine. And I am reminded in 2014 of a similar sentiment in the General Assembly for a vaccine for Ebola. And uh, as we speak, the vaccine has been developed. It's been developed outside uh, the UN system, but it's been brought in. And the World Health Organization has been asked by the United States to test this vaccine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And the United States is paying the WHO money to test the vaccine. So I think a similar approach needs to be taken. Uh, we need to focus on the ground realities and the solutions on the ground. So Ambassador, the, in the last word, do you think, are you optimistic of seeing global leadership emerge to fight this COVID menace? Well, I think because of the impact that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had uh, on all countries, but especially on a country like India, where we have aspirations to become a $5 trillion economy, that's not going to happen if the uh, impact of COVID is go not going to be mitigated. So I think it's in our interest to work with, as uh, Prime Minister Clark says, a coalition of countries who see this in their own self-interest. Multilateralism is not just a Don Quixote type of, uh, of utopian idealism. It's a very realistic diplomatic uh, platform. Multilateralism needs to demonstrate that it can deliver, in uh, the, based on the principle of international cooperation, a solution to this pandemic. And I think that that is something that we should be and could be working towards. And I hope that we do so. Ms. Clark, multilateralism, will it uh, help us get closer to a solution for COVID-19? Well, it, it, it has to, and uh, you know, really count on the leadership of India as uh, a hugely populous country with a fast-growing economy and a, a substantial voice. I think India's voice is critical on, on this uh, because it's a sign that a very large country like India sees the advantage of working cooperatively. None of us are an island. That we have these multilateral institutions because we know there are challenges where the answer doesn't lie within our own boundaries, no matter how large, how powerful uh, we are. Uh, and that isn't always so obvious to, to, to some great powers. But India gets it and has long been a stalwart supporter of the system. So I think you know, India's voice, India can be a, a leader on this uh, for the international system. 
Ellen Clark and Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee. Again, absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.